Good afternoon, and uh, I'm uh, back with Dr. Faisal Devji. Uh, Dr. Devji, as I mentioned earlier, and you've seen him on this platform, is a professor of history at the University of Oxford, and he's an um, internationally acclaimed scholar, particularly of South Asia and India. And uh, today, I wanted to uh, talk to uh, Faisal Devji about uh, Iqbal or Alama Iqbal as he is known in Pakistan and about uh, Iqbal's uh, political thought as well as his uh, uh, secular um, thinking. And uh, Dr. Devji, uh, first of all, welcome. And uh, I uh, was intrigued by your recent paper that you had shared some time back about uh, uh, you know, secular Islam. And of course, it's a very contentious uh, subject, you know, especially in Pakistan, where the word secular is treated as some kind of uh, ab abuse word <laughs> or, 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 a, or a jolt or a, or a potential threat to the nation state. So uh, what makes you, um, uh, you know, say that Iqbal was a secular uh, thinker and what would you and how would you place and how would you frame Iqbal's uh, political thought based on your readings and the research that you've been carrying out for years now? Well, uh, let's leave aside for the moment whether he was a secular thinker or not. But like everyone of his time and of our time, he had to engage with secularism as a category and as an idea. Uh, so if you look at uh, the very beginning of his very famous collection of lectures uh, published as the Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, uh, that book and those lectures begin with the statement that philosophy, which is what Iqbal thinks he's doing, must be free, is a site like politics of human freedom. Uh, and that freedom should be unconstrained. Uh, the problem he faces then, uh, which is, uh, the problem he faces is, how do you uh, reconcile that freedom with the equally necessary uh, desire and need for social stability, which depends upon uh, a certain, let us say, uh, uh, institutional conservatism, that things, many things should be left unquestioned, um, uh, that authority should exist uh, of various kinds, uh, that, that social uh, and popular and indeed religious uh, opinion uh, is not always amenable to philosophical or political ideals of freedom. So these two things need to be brought together in Iqbal's view and his lectures are about addressing uh, that coming together. Now, what he is interested in is uh, thinking about a different way in which freedom and authority or freedom and opinion uh, can meet or intersect. It's always a problematic meeting and intersection. That is the nature of politics. That is the nature of society. But he thinks that there is a way in which they can meet uh, uh, which departs from or is different from the way in which Western European thinkers have thought about the secular. Mm. Uh, so it is not a question of being pro or anti-secularism uh, as such, but it is a question uh, for Iqbal of thinking about different ways in which you can imagine the relationship between freedom and authority or freedom and opinion, both of which are necessary for any society to survive. Correct, correct. And, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned his lectures, and I've always thought that, you know, I mean, I've always found them to be extremely radical in so many ways, considering, you know, as you know, I grew up in Pakistan, where uh, the jurisprudence, you know, the established jurisprudence is the end. And uh, you cannot look beyond that, you're going to question that. And Iqbal in his lecture, number six, I think, openly questions that and says, actually, you need to move on and and leave them behind and find a new way so you know going back to uh, the earlier discussion i mean where would you locate the nikbal in the south asian history and the 
early 20th century, you know, uh, all the debates and political upheavals that were happening and, and how has that impacted? Because in Pakistan, Iqbal is now cited, you know, ch children are taught that Iqbal was this um, uh, proponent of, uh, of an Islamic state, of a, of a you know, religious um, identity of, of, of Pakistani Muslims. So how do, you, how do you see all of that, you know, within the South Asian context? Well, in some ways, you know, Iqbal is not alone. And I, um, uh, it is a kind of favorite trick of mine, if you will, to compare him with Gandhi, because they, are, they disagreed with each other politically on many things. But intellectually, uh, they were very similar. Um, so Gandhi, too, was an intensely religious man. And he, too, thought that religion and politics could not be separated. Mm -hmm. But what he and, indeed, Iqbal meant by this is very different from what uh, those who um, uh, proclaim themselves as his followers mean by this non-separation between what is religious and what is politics. Both Iqbal and Gandhi thought that by separating political or public life uh, from religious life uh, seen as being confined to the private, uh, what this meant was that public life would be given over entirely to violence and instrumentality because it would not be informed by any ideals because the ideals are all there for your personal and private life. So they were not interested in religion as such. They were interested in religion as an expression of the ideal, of, of the idealistic element uh, in, in human and social life. Uh, so this separation, which is the standard way in which Western European societies uh, have come to think about secularism, uh, is one that both Gandhi and Iqbal saw as being incredibly damaging because it made the public sphere or arena the site for pure instrumentality and violence and therefore violence. How do you actually attach the idealism that should belong to religion uh, to public life, uh, which after all cannot be so nicely and cleanly and easily sequestered from it? So this is the large problem which they both dealt with. But it's important to know that for Iqbal, when he criticizes European ideas of secularism, he's not criticizing them because he thinks that they are not religious. He criticizes them because he thinks that they are too religious, mm. that they are theological or what he, uh, he uses the word metaphysical. So he says, for instance, the division of public and private uh, uh, a division in which we can then put instrumentality and violence in public life and all our ideals and religion in our private life, A, that doesn't really work because life cannot be divided in that way cleanly. But B, the problem with it in Iqbal's view is that such a division is itself a theological division because he thinks it comes out of the monastic Christian division of the material and the spiritual. Yeah. That the life of the material and the life of the spirit were seen as two different things in monastic Christianity, uh, uh, but they were connected together. It was only with the Reformation uh, that he thinks that they're completely sundered and separated uh, from one another. He then sees the life of the material world uh, being hived off to become the site of politics, especially a politics of nationalism, uh, which is to say a community constructed on lines that um, are, are defined by ownership, property. The nation state itself is property writ large, is collective property, and it also guarantees private property or personal property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, whereas the world of spirit then becomes something that gives you sucker and that you can retreat to and all the rest. Uh, he sees this as a theological, as he puts it, metaphysical distinction. What he's interested, therefore, in uh, European secularism is that it is, what he finds worrying about it is that it remains theological, it remains religious, or it remains metaphysical, um, uh, despite itself. Uh, uh, so how do you actually turn away from that tradition and from the problems it makes possible and think about uh, the relationship of freedom and authority or freedom and opinion differently. This is the problem that he sets himself. And in some ways, it is the problem 
that Gandhi sets himself. And if I might say you know, one more thing before moving on to your next question. For both Gandhi and Iqbal, interestingly, um, these distinctions are made possible not because someone has this bright idea, this is the way in which we must, we must organize the world, but because colonial institutions create that world inadvertently uh, uh, and in very uh, particular and fragmented ways. Uh, so both Gandhi and Iqbal, for instance, thought that the colonial state, which had set itself up as a neutral third party, good liberal model, um, a neutral third party uh, there to mediate between the various conflicting and diverse interests of Indian society, that this vision of social relations was actually one that reconstructed religious groups, both Hindus and Muslims, and of course, Sikhs and Christians and others, into interests, uh, right? uh, which could only relate to one another through the state. And that was, if you will, the secret of colonialism, uh, the state had to make itself indispensable. Uh, so no social relations would be possible uh, in India without people going through it. Um, and in a way, this was one version of the secular mm. because it separated out the public from the private. Right? Right. Uh, and it made uh, these private interests uh, uh, relatable only through the public figure of the state with its institutions, eventually parliament and all the rest. Uh, this, both men considered a deeply violent state of affairs because it made, A, it made religious groups into interest groups, which they didn't think uh, should have been the case. Uh, and B, it made them dependent on the state and it made them relate to each other only through the state's mediation in an entirely conflictual way. Uh, that they could have no direct relations with one another. Uh, so Gandhi, you know, famously during the Khilafat movement, um, which, uh, as you know, was a movement uh, nowadays termed a pan-Islamic movement, uh, pan-Islamist movement, um, uh, in favor of the uh, caliphate uh, in Turkey at the end of the First World War, uh, Gandhi used the Khilafat movement to think about a new way in which religious groups could uh, address each other and could relate themselves to one another. He said, look, Hindus and Muslims are not linked by a contract. Uh, this is what the colonial state does. This is how it operates with its phalanxes of lawyers, etc. cetera. Right? Uh, the relationship between Hindus and Muslims is one not of contract because a contract is a purely commercial uh, document uh, and it is transient when the when the interests that give rise to a contract cease to exist the contract cease to, ceases to exist rather these religious groups relate to each other uh, immediately and directly without a third party but this means that they can actually be linked up um, without sharing a single belief right so his point Gandhi's point is the Khilafat movement is very important because Muslims who support it show in their support that they are driven by an ideal. Not all of them might be driven by an ideal, but the movement itself makes very little sense in terms of rational or pragmatic political action, right? It is driven by an ideal and so it is idealized. Uh, and Hindus, when they support it, should support it in order to partake of this idealism. But they don't believe in the caliphate themselves. Mm. Right? Correct. Um, they are simply supporting their neighbors uh, for a cause their neighbors believe in. They are performing, if you will, an act of sacrifice and of friendship and of neighborliness. Um, yeah. Similarly, yeah. Muslims who desire the friendship of Hindus are invited, uh, and indeed their leaders offered. Gandhi, uh, 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 the, the gift of abandoning cow, cow slaughter because cow slaughter was offensive to Hindus. Uh, Gandhi said to them, on no account is this going to be a deal. This is not a contract. Uh, we are not going to exchange the cow for the caliph. Right? 
if you want to give up cow slaughter out of deference to Hindu feelings, you should do so. But giving up cow slaughter also does not mean that Muslims believe in the sacredness of the cow, clearly. So in both cases, you have Hindus supporting the caliphate uh, without believing in it, and Muslims giving up cow slaughter without believing in the sacredness of the cow. They're doing it for other kinds of reasons. The cow and the caliph can become comparable precisely because they are so different. Uh, they cannot be fitted under one category uh, as they might be if you have this colonial situation of a neutral third party which defines everything else as equivalent interests. Right? So here are two groups supposedly engaging with each other on the basis of ideals which do not presume a singular belief uh, uh, and a relationship which is not defined by contractual obligations and conditions. Uh, right. Offers itself up as an invitation, a courtesy, and a gesture of friendship and neighborliness. So this is one way in which you could try to think about inter-religious relations without the third party colonial state and without these religious groups becoming merely political interests like other interests. Right, right. I, that's that's really fascinating uh, uh, perspective. And uh, but you know, you you said uh, a, a very important thing about the religious groups turning into interest groups and then being dependent on the state. And you know, so hasn't uh, that happened in post nineteen forty seven uh, Indian subcontinent, where especially in Pakistan, where you had these religious. Uh, groups and movements, you know, directly either embedded within the state or patronized by the state and to, to a large degree, even in, in, in India. And so, uh, so hasn't there been a kind of a, uh, the fear that Gandhi and Iqbal were articulating uh, in some ways turning into reality after 47? I mean, that, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, certain, sure. I, mean, I mean, I think that this is true even in their own time. Now, they both thought that um, uh, uh, what would save India, and when I use the word India, of course, I'm talking about British India, so it includes what is today Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, what would save India was the fact that the colonial state uh, remained in some ways marginal. Uh, of course, it was very powerful, but it didn't affect everyone's lives. Uh, and also that interests tend to be defined in terms of property. You have an interest in something you own, even if it's your own body or your own identity, so self-interest. Uh, but they thought that India, partly because of her poverty, uh, 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 represented a society in which property could not be generalized to define all social relations. So, which is why both Gandhi and Iqbal thought that you could see so much self-sacrifice uh, often irrational, like the Khilafat movement, right, in terms of interest politics uh, in modern Indian history, because it was, uh, social relations are not completely defined by property. And so interest groups could not coalesce and form uh, so easily and so firmly. But having said that, I agree with you. Today, it is almost like um, uh, it's impossible to think about religious groups uh, which are not at the same time interest groups. That is the condition for them uh, having a political life or, or, or political existence. Yet I would add uh, that they cannot entirely hegemonize or define or determine all social life and all social relations, which is why they need to constantly turn to sacrificial and idealistic elements. Hmm. Uh, now, sometimes these sacrificial and idealistic elements end up doing a great deal of harm and are very violent without ceasing to be idealistic. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the worst example, of course, is the, the figure of the suicide bomber, uh, yes. someone who sacrifices his or her life. Um, but we should not, I think, ignore the fact that perverse or perverted as these acts may be, within them still lies, uh, if you will, uh, a nub of something that cannot be uh, recuperated or appropriated by rational, 
interest-based politics, uh, which are supposedly all about maximizing your ownership of some good, whether it is your own self, your religion, your ideology, your physical property, or, or anything else. All of these things have been conceived of in terms of property. Iqbal was very, very particular about this. You know, he thought property um, lay at the basis of imperialism and nationalism. In fact, nationalism made property even more oppressive a presence yeah. uh, in, um, in social life because the nation state was itself conceived of as a collective property. Exactly, exactly. Very, very uh, well put. Uh, so, uh, so going, uh, coming back to Iqbal's uh, religious and political, I mean, you know, uh, thought and uh, the various, um, so, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Faisal, have you, uh, have you also seen um, uh, some of the strands? Because these themes are also present in his poetry and, you know, huge corpus of his poetic works. And one of the criticisms that uh, often people make is that, you know, there are contradictory positions that Iqbal takes, you know. So it's like, you know, one one day you're writing in praise of Lenin and uh, the, the next uh, day you, uh, you go back to a religious uh, symbolism and reject the West in its entirety. And so in Pakistan, you know, there's been selective cherry picking of his poetry, which is anti-West or anti, as you said, anti-Western secular thought. And that is, that is taken as a justification to say that secularism play, holds no value for the modern, modern Pakistani life. And uh, so in, in that sense, where would you uh, locate Iqbal's work and uh, thinking for contemporary Pakistan, as you are a scholar of Pakistan too? So uh, I just want to pick your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I tend to think he's not actually very contradictory. Um, there is something really, um, deeply unifying and continuous about his thought from, from the earliest times. Now he shifts his vocabulary yeah. uh, and references uh, over the course of his career. Uh, but, you know, all the themes that you see in his, uh, his doctoral uh, thesis, uh, the development of metaphysics in Persia, which is 1908, yes. uh, you see in a very late work like the Javed Nama, his famous Persian uh, epic, uh, poetic epic. Uh, uh, and he deploys different themes in different languages as well. You know, so writing in Persian, he's much more in quotes Hindu. Uh, he is he's much more um, uh, interested in foregrounding Indian history, both Muslim and non-Muslim. Um, uh, and he, he, you know, the, the Buddha, uh, Hinduism, the Vedic age, Sanskrit texts, etc., come up much more in Persian than they do in his Urdu poetry. So very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, he's a you know, as poets and philosophers are, he's a complex man. Man, but I don't think he's a contradictory thinker. Um, right, right. Though you know, there are diff different parts of his work exhibit different kinds of um, mm. facets of his personality. But I guess uh, one of the things I'd like to say in, in terms of how he deals with the secular is, yes, he's a critic of European secularism, as I said, but he's in part a critic of it because he thinks it's too religious, it's too theological, right? And he thinks that the distinction it makes is an unworkable distinction uh, and comes out of a specifically uh, Christian history, the Reformation, right? So he tries, therefore, to think about other ways in which you can imagine the relationship of freedom and authority or of freedom and opinion, right? And one of the ways he does this is by, uh, as, an exp as a thought experiment, is by saying, look, the European notion is entirely spatial. It's about space, public and private, right? How about if we think of the relationship in temporal terms, in terms of time rather than space? Right. And you know that Iqbal's philosophy and poetry is very much 
uh, dominated by ideas of time and temporality. Yeah. So he gives two examples, almost as a thought experiment, right? Uh, one is a Shia and one is a Sunni example. Okay. He's not discriminating on those grounds. Yeah. The Shia example is the following. He says, look, uh, with the occultation of the 12th Imam, the disappearance, the vanishing of the Imam, uh, you cannot institute a perfect religious society because that would be a sin. Only the presence of the Imam makes a society perfect. Therefore, until the Imam returns, what we have is an admittedly religiously imperfect society, but it is at the same time a society which is the site of human freedom. This is what makes human beings free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is a way of thinking about what is religion and what is not religion in terms of time rather than space. The Sunni version he gives is the following. Because the prophet is the last prophet, according to Muslim belief, uh, direct divine uh, communication of a public nature, of a, a juridical or legal or revelational nature, comes to an end with the prophet. Correct. This means that after the prophet, you have a realm which is on the one hand a realm of human imperfection, because the prophet is not there, but on the other hand is also an arena for human freedom. Uh, because the prophet has, as it were, annulled his own authority. He uses a term like this, in fact to make human beings free. And he sees in Islam, he sees in the finality of prophecy, uh, Islam's greatest gift, because he thinks that Islam annuls divine authority in the present. And in doing so, it really makes humanity or the human race into a historical actor for the first time, right? So the condition of freedom is of course imperfection. Mm. Uh, in both cases, in the Shia and the, and the Sunni case, in both cases, it is time that defines what is free and what is uh, unfree, or rather what is determined by authority and what is determined by freedom. Uh, and as you know, his poetry, since you asked about his poetry, is dominated by themes of incompletion, yes. right? Um, that, you know, this is the, the, the kashti, the ship that can never get to its shore. You know, right. the famous line from Hafez, you know, it begins. Um, uh, the stars in the sky, you know, that circle and never meet each other, like lovers who never meet. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, and for, him, for Iqbal, incompletion is at the same time uh, tragic and beautiful. Right? But it is the site of freedom, because freedom is about incompletion. You can never have the perfect stasis of absolute authority, right? The absence of the prophet on the one hand and the absence of the 12th Imam on the other allow human freedom to flourish. Um, and he often indeed sees um, in his poetry figures such as the devil, Satan himself, as um, representatives of this freedom. In the lectures on the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, he writes about the historic Adam Right? So Adam, of course, refuses to bow. Uh, sorry, uh, not the, the, the devil refuses to bow to Adam. Yeah. Uh, and in doing so is both uh, uh, extra faithful to God because God has told him not to bow before anyone but God. <clears throat> but of course, disobeys God at the same time. So that's one representation of freedom. The other representation is Adam himself because Adam disobeys God, of course, in eating of the fruit and then is thrown out of paradise. For Iqbal, this is a sign not of the fall, this is a sign of human freedom, uh, that refusing or rejecting authority um, is how freedom manifests itself. Right. Now, of course, his trick is to say all of these things in a thoroughly Islamic idiom, uh, so, uh, not simply so that it could become palatable to Muslim readers, uh, but because in doing so, he could show them uh, that this kind of thinking already existed. 
uh, these are not unfamiliar themes. <clears throat> yeah, within the Islamic tra tra tradition, right? So it was not unfamiliar. Uh, in fact, Sufism in particular and poetry uh, in general were very keen on these oppositional themes. Uh, so, you know, God could be the beloved. And of course, one of the things that happens in Urdu and Persian poetry is you always disagree with the beloved or you fight with the beloved or you are <laughs> annihilated by something, right? So it is, a, it is a relationship of great intimacy and passion and loyalty. But at the same time, it is a relationship uh, uh, that implies disobedience, imperfection, and freedom. Uh, it can be tragic, but that tragedy is also the site of beauty. And Iqbal's aesthetics, he links art and beauty to imperfection. Uh, to uh, imperfection, I don't mean in terms of, I'm, uh, what I mean is uh, um, uh, not that beauty is uh, somehow ugly, uh, but rather imperfection means that you haven't yet reached a goal uh, where everything can come to an end. You are still on your journey. And the journey is what is beautiful. And that is what only human beings can know. And God, he rhetorically says, cannot. Yes, yes. Uh, exactly. So in all of these ways, both in his philosophy and his political writings and in his poetry, Iqbal is experimenting uh, with these different ways of thinking about freedom mm. uh, in terms of temporality rather than spatiality, in poetic and religious terms rather than in terms of uh, uh, public and private, or the secular and the communal, right? Yes. Uh, and those things are everywhere in his work. You just have to see them. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's that's really uh, uh, in interesting because uh, you know this also kind of um, uh, demonstrates that within the Islamic tradition, there's so much potential to not just think, but also to. Uh, you know, as Iqbal and, and others have put it, you know, to for both uh, self-realization and and <clears throat> come up with alternative ways uh, in that journey, incomplete journey that human beings undertake through the various ages. So, uh, just just uh, my last question would be uh, the very term secular Islam. So, how would you? I mean, you know, that's also intriguing. I mean, you know, in terms of language and linguistic. Uh, power and uh, and uh, uh, so I I want to know a little bit more about that and I'm sure the viewers would, would be very interested because you know how this whole construction global construction of of Islam as this kind of uh, uh, you know uh, ir um, irrational and anti secular uh, faith I mean it persists so much in the public domain now that it's very difficult to even you know, counter that. So I think I'll, I'll, that's my last question. Yeah, I mean, but let me begin with um, the Nehru report. So 1928, you have the Nehru report issued, uh, which is a plan for the constitutional future of India and Iqbal criticizes it. And the language in which Iqbal criticizes it is very interesting because what he does is he points out uh, that the, what he agrees with the Nehru report, the, the Nehru report of obviously is secular in a certain sense, and its authors point, uh, are against what they call communalism, right? Uh, which is to say narrow religious loyalties yeah. as opposed to wider national ones, right? But they say, look, yes, we are against narrow religious loyalties, but by the same token, we understand that national loyalty is equally narrow as compared to or contrasted with international loyalty, for instance. So they see all of these things in a continuum rather than as being, you know, an either or an opposition. And Iqbal points to this and he says, yes, that's quite right. Um, communalism uh, and nationalism are placed on a continuum. They're not opposites of one another. Now, I mention this because until independence, the word uh, secularism was not very popular in India, right? The antithesis was communalism, which was seen as being religious, uh, and nationalism. Only after independence 
has secularism come into the picture in a big way. So now we talk about secularism versus communalism. Uh, when you had communalism and nationalism, you could see that they were part of a continuum. There was no uh, absolute opposition uh, between them. It was a question of, if you will, negotiation. Right? Uh, so that's one thing, that the language we use has changed. Right. Uh, right? Uh, the other thing I suppose I would say is that, um, and Iqbal knew this very well, uh, that in a way it is only after the institution of a certain kind of secular state, i.e. colonial India, because colonial India was secular in the sense that uh, it was a state that proclaimed that it would not distinguish between different religious groups and treat them all equally. Uh, and that was something that was not true of Britain, because yeah. Britain then and now has a state church, right? The Anglican Church, the Church of England is the national church. And the head of state, the queen, is the head of the Church of England and is the defender of the faith. That was not true of India. So the British actually invented secularism in India first before they themselves got it in a way. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it was also secular in the sense that it, the Indian Penal Code, mm. uh, one of whose authors was Lord Macaulay, uh, did not and, uh, contain a provision for blasphemy, which British law did contain until very recently, right? Until the late 1990s, I think. Um, and it didn't contain a uh, provision for blasphemy precisely because it was meant to be a non-religious uh, or if you will, secular state. It was the secular state that made religion possible in a sense, uh, because it cut the strings that had bound religious life to political life, and it set religion free in a way. This is also what has happened since the 18th century, since its founding to the United States. Uh, the fact that religion is as it was set free allows it to proliferate, uh, which is why the United States is such a religious, deeply religious society. And Britain is not. It's immigrants here who are religious, not very often native-born English people. Um, uh, so in a way, the religion that then sets itself up against secularism is itself the product of secularism. Uh, and it's a product of secularism because it has been set free from the political order. It no longer has a connection to it, which is what both Gandhi and Iqbal mourned. But the connection they were thinking of was not this connection that the political order will be completely defined by religious rules, right? What they wanted from religion was its idealistic or sacrificial element uh, and the making of an organic, if you will, social life. Uh, so the big change here was the disappearance of, let's say, uh, Hindu, or in, in our case, if you're talking about Pakistan, for the most part, Muslim rule. Yes. Right? Um, uh, that you, you know, as long as there were Muslim kings and princes and emperors, they controlled the religious establishment or tried to. Uh, and uh, their states had their own political logics. They were not defined entirely by religious law. In fact, they were not. Uh, there was Sharia and there was Kanun and Kanun was law that was not religious law, that was royal law. Right? It may have been informed by Sharia on occasion, but it was not authorized by it. Similarly, the Mughals, the dynastic legitimacy of the Mughals went back to a goddess, to a Mongol goddess. They were Muslims, but they still referred to this goddess, right? And to the Yasa of Genghis Khan. So it went back to pre-Islamic times, deliberately because it was not to be defined in purely religious terms. This is a goddess they did not believe in, right? Yes. Yes. Just like, you know, Muslims did not believe in the sacredness of the cow, but they were willing to forego her slaughter. So it has been the disappearance of these pre-colonial forms of uh, kingship and authority, however good, bad, or indifferent they might have been in other respects, that literally set religion free in South Asia. It made Hinduism and Islam what they are today. Okay. Uh, and it made them as the 
products of secularism, the kind of secularism that many of their spokesmen are now cavilling or complaining against. I, it's a great irony. Yes, exactly. If you want to look at what you might call profane or secular authority, all you have to do is to look at uh, the culture and the law of pre-colonial, in this case, Muslim kingship, not just in South Asia, all over the world. Uh, and all the new work, research, academic research that is coming out on them, on these dynasties and these figures, tells you this story. So even the caliphate in, in the Ottoman Empire uh, was justified and legitimized in a language that is not the language, ironically, of Islamic law. Uh, it was justified in terms of philosophy and in terms of mysticism or Sufism, yes, uh, whichever word you would like to use. Right? And this is the result of, of uh, you know, recent research on the matter. So I think it's the disappearance of the pre-colonial state or states um, that has made religion what it is today. Um, and uh, uh, it is in that form of royal authority uh, that we can find, if you will, a language for pre of the language of pre-modern politics, uh, because that is what we have lost. Um, uh, I'm not glorifying these states and these princes. All I'm saying is that they possessed a political language uh, which has gone. There are only fragments of it that remain to us. We still use words like Nizam and Hukumat and Sultan, well, Sultanate not so much in a republic like Pakistan, uh, but they are just fragments. They no longer refer to a systematic body of thought. Uh, there is no political language left from pre-colonial times. Uh, and the religious language that is meant to replace the political language cannot really do that job. It cannot really perform that function. Um, it is the autonomy of that political language that people like Iqbal were interested in, insofar as they were anti-colonial thinkers. And they understood the political realm as being the realm of freedom, because politics in modern times is meant to be the site where you fight for your freedom. Right. Right. And philosophy too is linked to politics in this sense, because philosophy too is dedicated to human freedom, right. the freedom of thought and reflection and all the rest. Those two things are linked, right? uh, politics and philosophy. And therefore, Iqbal comes back to them over and over again. And perhaps he might say poetry too, certainly his kind of poetry. Whereas religious authority and public opinion or popular opinion belong together as, if you will, more conservative sources of authority. Hmm. Um, uh, of course, political authority also exists, and there are connections with all, between all these realms. But Iqbal is very interested in seeing how you might not disconnect them in the way that he thought European uh, secularism did, but reconnect them while at the same time retaining their differences, uh, making their coexistence possible in a way that's not necessarily a contractual way. So he says, I'm sorry, I'm being very uh, long-winded, but he, he says very deliberately in a letter he wrote to Nehru, uh, to Jawaharlal Nehru, he says, look, uh, whereas European secularism is metaphysical because it's based upon these ideas of the material and the spiritual, when you see, and he may or may not have been right, this is what he thought, when you see the over history, the way in which the office of the, he gives this example of the Sheikh al-Islam uh, uh, is split off from the office of the Vizier or the Grand Vizier, right? You see how in pre-modern Muslim states, you have a division of functions. The Sheikh al-Islam is responsible for Islam. Mm. He's not the same person as the Vizier. Correct, correct. And the Vizier is not the same person as the Sultan or the Khalifa. Right, he says to Nehru, "This is a division of functions. This is not a metaphysical division." So it's very interesting. He's saying, 
here is what is happening. There's a distinction between what is Islamic and what is not Islamic in the pre-modern Muslim state. That distinction is itself, if you will, in quotes, secular or profane. Its logic is not a religious logic, unlike the distinction of public and private or secular and religious in the West. That at least is his argument. We don't have to believe in it, but what we do need to do, I think, is to attend to what he was trying to think, to make thinkable. Uh, nothing less than freedom itself, uh, freedom in the political arena and freedom of thought, freedom in the philosophical and the poetic arena. Thank you so much, Faisal. This was a fascinating uh, discussion and I'm sure the viewers would enjoy it. And particularly, you know, the key takeaway here is the freedom of thought. And I hope that Pakistan and Pakistani authorities and people who will watch this will remember this about Iqbal and, and try and follow it and implement it. So we hope to uh, uh, see you again next week. And until then, thank you very much. I'm going to...